Walsh, and this is The Sports Show, brought to you every Wednesday at 5.30 and 10 by Willing City Cable TV, and also our new time of 10.30 on Sunday evenings, immediately following Focus with Sheila Sheehan. On tonight's show, we'll have the best in girls softball, Danny's Angels, as they prepare for the New England tournament. Also, the area's only soapbox derby competition, highlights of the championship round of the Hawthorne Country Club four ball, and the New Bedford Recreation Department's popular recreation day. But in our studios right now, we have Barry Darwell from WNBH, and in just one minute, he's gonna speak on a very important local controversy. This bumper sticker could win valuable prizes for you. Place this Whaling City cable TV bumper sticker on your car, and you could win a pocket electro flash camera valued at $30. When we spot one of these stickers on your bumper, we'll take down the license plate number and display it on our cable TV channel 13 weather board. All you have to do to collect your prize is keep your eye on our weather board until you see your license plate number, then bring in your registration as proof of ownership. Just pick up a sticker at our main studios at 700 Kempton Street or at the following locations. Newberry TV and Appliance, at 1446 Acushnet Avenue in New Bedford, or 410 Main Street in Fairhaven, or at the Portuguese Times at 61 West Rodney French Boulevard. With us today in our Channel 13 studios is Barry Darwell, Operations Manager for Radio Station WNBH in the city of New Bedford. And Barry, this weekend, Mayor Markey was forced to turn off the lights in a number of area parks and playgrounds because the city council wouldn't appropriate the funds to continue them throughout the remainder of the year. WNBH has gotten involved, and in exactly what way have you become involved? WNBH is now assuming the cost of lighting in our parks and playgrounds until such a time as the citizens of New Bedford can be adequately heard on this issue, and until such a time as the city council can react to public opinion. When will the citizens of New Bedford have the opportunity to express their beliefs? Tomorrow night at 7 o'clock, there's a special city council meeting at which time the citizens will be able to speak. Now, is this open to the public, or is it limited to just those groups that use the playgrounds and parks? No, it is open to the public, and one of the reasons why WMBH has become involved in this project is that it affects so many adults and children who are residents of New Bedford who use these facilities at night. Now, Barry, you said that WNBH would be willing to fund the lights from now until the po that point in time at which uh, the city council is able to make a decision. Well, what happens Thursday night if they don't make a decision and they delay it indefinitely? Will you still, you, will you still continue to pick up the tab? I think if an uh, adequate uh, reason is given why the uh, issue has to be delayed, WNBH will remain with the program. Well, Barry, I think it's a very magnanimous gesture on the part of radio station WNBH, and thank you for stopping by and speaking to us about it on the sports show. Well, thank you for having me, Bill. Danny's Angels, the Massachusetts women's major softball state champions, they'll be off to the New England tournament August 19th in Rawlingsford, New Hampshire. They won the state championship this weekend at Brooklawn Park by virtue of consecutive wins of 5-3 to three and 2 to nothing scores over another New Bedford team, St. Luke's Hospital, in the finals of the four-day tournament. For nine years, the Angels have been coached by Danny Consatio, who is no stranger to the New England tournament. He's been there twice before, winning it two years ago and advancing to the Nationals in Jacksonville, Florida. Aided by assistant coaches Ricky Brown and wife Bunny Consatio, Danny has established the Angels as one of the finest girls softball teams in not only the area, but in the entire New England region. But it couldn't have been done without talent. At third base, an assistant purchasing agent for the Alden Corrugated Company when she's not playing softball, number 19, Annette Desrosias. At the shortstop position, a Rhode Island College junior, number 8, Joanne Avedesian. And at second base, she makes her living as a machine operator, number 14, Sue Cardoza. The first base woman, a senior at Bridgewater State College, number one, Gail Cameron. The pitcher for Danny's Angels, with a sterling 30 and 4 record throughout the season, Pauline Desroges. She's a clerical typist at the Grinnell Pajama Company. In 
In left field, number 16 and Bridgewater State College senior Patty Perry. The left center fielder, number 18 Aggie Ballard, who works as a shipping clerk when she's not playing the outfield. In right center field, sporting a batting average of over 500, number 17, Sue Wallace. In right field, a sophomore at Northeastern University, number 9, Lori Avedesian, is seen here tossing the ball to her shortstop sister, Joanne. Behind the plate, number 5, Elaine Clement, a teacher at Oliver Ames High School in Easton, she shares the duties with number 11, Mary O'Connell. Not to mention Karen Abood, Barbara Doncaster, and Cindy Sharrick, who all see substantial time in the outfield. The sports show took its cameras to Brooklawn Park this past Friday as Danny's Angels took on McDougal's Cafe of Lynn in the first game of the state tournament. We pick up the action in the top half of the fourth inning with Danny's ahead by a 4-2 score. After a fly out to center field, Patty Perry alertly throws home to nab the opposing player in a rundown to end the inning. Catcher Mary O'Connell leads off in the bottom half of the fourth for Danny's and flies out to left center field. After Lori Anderson flied out to left for the second out, it was Sue Wallace's turn at the plate. Sue looked at two strikes before ripping a grounder to the shortstop. and advanced to second on the throwing error at first base. But pitcher Pauline Desrosiers strands Laurie at second as she flies out to end the inning. The score remains Danny's Angels 4, McDougal's Cafe 2. In the top half of the fifth inning, second baseman Sue Cardoza makes a beautiful play on a hard-hit ball for the first out. McDougal's manages to get on first by virtue of a base hit, which sets the stage for this controversial play again by Sue Cardoza. The base runner was called out by the umpire for leaving the base path, which didn't settle too well with the opposing coach, seen here protesting the call but didn't change the decision either. After another base hit by McDougal's, an attempted throwout goes by the first baseman, allowing a run in. The score now Danny's Angels by only four to three. A valiant effort by third baseman Annette Desrosiers is in vain, and another base hit down the left field line drives in their second run of the inning, tying the game. A fly ball to center field gets them out of the inning. The score now reading, Danny's four, McDougal's four. Joanne Avedesian, the team's leading hitter with a 575 batting average, leads off the bottom half of the fifth inning, but flies out to the second baseman. Left center fielder Aggie Ballard pops up to the shortstop for the second out but Annette Desrosiers drills a shot to the left field fence, resulting in a triple bagger, but died on third as Gail Cameron lined out to the right center fielder for the third out, the contest still deadlocked. The enemies now had their golden opportunity to go ahead for the first time in the game and could almost sense imminent victory, but it wasn't to be. The Angels' defense operated like a well-oiled machine in the top half of the sixth inning, their precision execution putting McDougal's batting order down 1-2-3 in a game that was heating up to a fever pitch. Time was running out. Danny's had to generate some offensive punch soon, and second baseman Sue Cardoza was quick to oblige in the lower half of the sixth. After Patty Perry flied out to left center to register the first out of the inning, Catcher Mary O'Connell came through with a single to center field to put a runner in scoring position. Right fielder Lori Avedesian then stepped to the plate and drew a walk to load the bases with still only one out. It was then up to Sue Wallace, 
the team's second best hitter with a 500 average, to come through when Danny's Angels needed it most. Her triple drove in three runs, making the score now seven to four, giving the Angels a little breathing room. But the onslaught wasn't over yet as pitcher Pauline Desroges steps up to the plate. Pauline's home run virtually put the game out of reach as Danny's now held a 9-4 edge. The Angels continued to pour it on, however, Joanne Evadesian drilling one to left and making it safely to second base. Aggie Ballard is thrown out at first base. Danny's now with two down in the bottom of the sixth, but Annette Desroges hits safely up the middle, scoring Joanne Evadesian for an insurance run, the tally now reading 10-4. Gail Cameron flies out to center to end the inning. McDougal's left with one last chance at bat. The defense held up for Danny's Angels in the final inning. McDougal's again going down 1-2-3. The final score 10-4. Danny's Angels went on to win the tournament and the state championship, and they're off to the New England Championships August 19th in New Hampshire. Danny's Angels of New Bedford the Massachusetts State Softball Champions. This bumper sticker could win valuable prizes for you. Place this Wailing City cable TV bumper sticker on your car and you could win a pocket electro flash camera valued at $30. When we spot one of these stickers on your bumper, we'll take down the license plate number and display it on our cable TV channel 13 weather board. All you have to do to collect your prize is keep your eye on our weather board until you see your license plate number, then bring in your registration as proof of ownership. Just pick up a sticker at our main studios at 700 Kempton Street or at the following locations. Newberry TV and Appliance at 1446 Acushnet Avenue in New Bedford, or 410 Main Street in Fairhaven, or at the Portuguese Times at 61 West Rodney French Boulevard. Sunday, July 23rd. At 10 a.m., the temperature already approaching 90 degrees in the hot sun in Fairhaven, Massachusetts. The sports show camera is there to take a look at a very different but very American sports phenomenon for the youngsters, the Soapbox Derby. Sponsored by the North Fairhaven Improvement Association, it's the only one of its kind in the area, and it's surprising there aren't more, judging from the interest and enthusiasm of participants and spectators alike this weekend. The future A.J. Foyts and Mario Andretti's got a chance to work out the kinks and get used to the course in the form of trial runs prior to the actual start of racing. The whole event was extremely well organized, and nothing was overlooked in the preparations, as trucks were available to cart the vehicles away from the finish line, and everything in the line of safety for the drivers seen to beforehand. Testimony to the hard work of President Roger Bergeron, Chairman Ted Botello, and assistants Dave Rabello, Larry Oliver, and Joe Tavares. The sports show spoke with the president about the event. Roger, uh, you picked uh, one of the best days of the year to have this thing, except it might be a little too hot. It's about 95 degrees right now. Yeah, it sure is, but uh, we had a terrific turnout for the heat, and uh, we really want to thank everybody that did come and at the participants, the children that uh, were in the derby them themselves. I think, I think it was a wonderful thing for them. How long uh, has the Soapbox Derby been going on here in Fairhaven? This here is our second annual derby. We started last year and we're looking forward to a better year next year. 
and how many kids uh, ordinarily participate in something like this? Well, last year we had approximately, I think it was 17, and this year we had 22, so it's increasing. Well, it's a very interesting thing, and Roger, it's great for the community. Congratulations. It's a very excellent soapbox, Trevor. Thank you very much. Finally, the races began. 22 entries competed in two different divisions, the 8- to 10-year-old group and the 11- to 13-year-old class, both divisions open to boys and girls alike. It was a single elimination affair. If you lost a race, you were out of the running, but if you won, you continued competing on to the quarterfinals and semifinals and so on until there was an ultimate winner in each age group. In the finals of the 11 to 13 year old class, Rebecca Broadbent, on the right of your screen, noses out number two, Peter Botello, in an exciting finish. He's wiping out. The winner of the 8 to 10 year old division was Jimmy Carvalho, as he edged out Dale Jason at the finish line which set the stage for the overall championship of the day. Rebecca Broadbent in the left lane, the winner of the 11 to 13 year olds, and Jimmy Cavallo, the 8 to 10 year old champ in the right lane, will now see who has the fastest soapbox in Fairhaven. This is it! She won it. Yeah, she got it. Number four, Rebecca Broadman. She's not eliminated of the day. The overall winner of the Fairhaven Soapbox Derby, Rebecca Broadbent. We spoke to the exultant champion in Victory Lane. Rebecca, uh, how long have you been doing this? Uh, Three years. Three years. And who helps you uh, build the machine? My father, my mother, and my sister. And uh, how long does it take to make something like this? I don't really know. Uh, do you practice at all? I mean, do you? Did they have any? Did you have any practice sessions with your father and mother uh, riding it down hills? Yeah, this morning we did. How many times did you do it before? Uh, I've been in three years in a soapbox derby. This is my fourth year. And how did you do in the past? Uh, I got uh, third place and fourth place. How much does something like this cost, Rebecca? I wouldn't know. <laughs> <laughs> well, you ran a great race today. What What is it that made your uh, soapbox run faster than the others? Uh, the official wheels and uh, the shape of it, it's pointier and, and just sound better. And just real good driving. Yeah, luck. <laughs> <laughs> Rebecca, congratulations. Great, great race today. Thank you. And the winner of the best looking car, selected by judges Paul Novak and Police Chief Al Raphael, Mark Darmafall's Flaming Fury. Mark, uh, it really is an excellent car. You must have put a lot of work in on it. Yeah, I did. Who helped you with it? My father. How long does it take to make something like this? About 20 hours. 20 hours to put it together or 20 hours just to get it ready for the race? 20 hours to put it together. Now, how long have you been running in soapboxes? This is my first time. And this is your first uh, soapbox car ever? Yes. Did you paint it yourself and put all the decals on it? No, I did not. I just painted it red. And how much uh, does this cost you, money-wise? I don't know. Your father uh, helped you out there? Yeah. Well, it's a great-looking car, and you ran a great race today, Mark. Congratulations. Thank you. So that's it. From Cogsall Street in Fairhaven, Massachusetts, the site of the 1978 Soapbox Derby. Liberty Ports 
Pacific. The Navy. See a recruiter or call toll free. It's not just a job, it's an adventure. The Hawthorne Country Club in North Dartmouth, the scene of this Sunday's championship round in the Hawthorne Invitational Golf Tournament. In the consolation match held earlier in the day, the team of George Harkins and Dick Bannett defeated Gabe Simmons and Dave Scott 2 and 1 to place in the money. But all eyes were on this round of golf as brothers Paul and Pete Gurney took on the team of Alex Valm and Bill Bettencourt for the championship. The sports show picks up the action on the 11th green with the Gurneys one hole up, Alex Valm sinking a nifty six foot putt to win the hole, the match all even after 11. We go to the 12th tee, none of the players hitting the green on the short par three except Paul Gurney who places this beautiful shot only feet from the pin. Betancourt is long out of the trap, and Alex Valm is unsuccessful in his attempt for par, leaving it up to Pete Gurney to sink this short putt to put the Gurneys one up, going to the 13th. The longest hole on the course, the par 5 13th, saw each player hit towering drives down the fairway. But only Pete Gurney and Bill Bettencourt figured in the scoring, having the hole. The Gurneys with a one hole lead. The uphill par 4 14th was next the flag only partially visible through the trees, everyone landing safely in the fairway. Bill Bettencourt hits a nice approach shot to the green, but it remained for Pete Gurney to steal the show, his ball landing just three feet away from the pin. Pete Gurney's birdie putt gave his team the advantage, but Bill Bettencourt, who received an extra shot on the hole by virtue of his handicap, putted for a net birdie to have the hole. The team of Gurney and Gurney still won up after 14. Paul Gurney stroked a magnificent drive on the par 4 15th hole, placing his ball on the fringe of the green and chipped on nicely in excellent position for a birdie. Bill Bettencourt had to sink this putt to at least have the hole, but it wasn't in the stars, and the Gurneys went two up with only three holes to play. After having the 16th, Gurney and Gurney are now up by two holes with only two to play, Valm and Betancourt on the verge of elimination. Pete Gurney tees off on the 17th and drills his shot out of bounds, but Paul holds up the team with a safe shot in the fairway, although short of the green. Both Valm and Betancourt are in position to win the hole with solid tee shots off the 17th, but Paul Gurney chips up safely onto the middle of the green in scoring position. Bill Bettencourt, his team's only hope on this hole, leaves his putt a little short, but with not too difficult a putt remaining. His brother Pete out of contention, Paul Gurney is in the position of winning the entire tournament if he can sink this long putt. And he just barely misses. It now remains for Bill Bettencourt to sink this pressure putt from six feet out to win the 17th and push the championship to the final hole. He misses the putt and loses the match. Paul and Pete Gurney, the only brother combination to ever win the Hawthorne Invitational Four Ball Championship. The sports show spoke with the champions shortly after their victory. I'm with brothers Paul and Pete Gurney, the winners of the four-ball invitational tournament.
Pete, must be very satisfying. It's great, especially Paul told me that this is what he wanted for a long time, and I helped him on about four holes out of 36, but <laughs> he played well. Paul, this is the same hole that you lost it on last year, is that correct? Yes, it was an absolute heartbreaker last year, and this year, as luck would have it, I won it here, which is fantastic. I've been waiting a long, long time for this. And you had to win, in order to win the tournament, you had to win six straight uh, games of golf, is that correct? This year it was five, because we had a 32-team field. Last year it was six, and I guess it was that last match that got me this year. One short, but I still won the five that you, you need to win the tournament. Well, Paul, Pete, congratulations. Winners of the Hawthorne Invitational Four Ball Tournament. Thank you very much. Thank you. That concluded a fine day of golf, and the sports show hung around long enough for the awards presentation shortly following the championship round, the various winners agreeing to display their trophies. Paul and Pete Gurney, the 1978 Hawthorne Invitational Four Ball Golf Tournament champions. Sunday, July 23rd, at Hazelwood Park and Municipal Beach in the city's south end, there took place an annual event called Recreation Day. Sponsored by Southeastern Bank and Trust and the city's recreation department, Recreation Day has become a popular summertime happening for the city's youth and growing in numbers each year. Boys and girls competed separately in three different age categories in such events as the softball throw, 25-yard swim, 100-yard swim, basketball foul shooting, and 50-yard dash. That's not to mention a bicycle race and four-mile road race as well. The sports show spoke with Assistant Recreation Director Herb Rigo about Recreation Day. Herb, you're becoming a permanent fixture down there. You've been there how long now? 22 years, Bill. 22 years. Uh, Recreation Day, the event you're having here today at the Municipal Beach in Hazelwood Park. This has been in existence how long? Seven years with Southeast and Bank and Trust. And uh, an excellent crowd on hand today. I don't think I've seen a bigger crowd here in years. Very good crowd, excellent crowd. Well, the weather helps us out. That's why we pushed it up to uh, July. How many would you estimate are here? Oh, it must be around 8,000 people. How much work uh, is involved in this? I know this is more or less your project. Uh, how long in advance do you have to prepare for something like this? Uh, to get the different bands and the equipment, things like that, maybe about four months. And how many kids participate in it? Uh, roughly 400 participants in all the events. Well, Herb, it's a great thing, and uh, you're doing a great job with it. Continue success with the Recreation Department. Thank you, Bill. I'm with Barry Munier, Director of Recreation for the City of New Bedford. Barry, a very hot but a very successful recreation down here, uh, day down here at the Municipal Beach. Yes, I think we had a very good turnout, Billy, and um, the events went were well participated in, and everything went pretty smoothly, and as soon as we get the finish of this four-mile road race, then we'll be ready to give out the awards, and the... The band was very good, and the children's musical went over very well, so I'd say it's a very good day. Barry, uh, let me change the subject a little bit right here. The city council voted this Thursday to shut off some of the lights. Mayor Markey then ordered a number of the lights in area parks shut off. Uh, exactly what lights are shut off in what parks? Okay, I haven't talked to the mayor about this, but from my understanding, it, right now, the um, as of Friday, when the mayor announced the shutdown, that all the basketball lights in the city would be left on. Those that would be affected would be the Little League fields, the um, adult softball leagues, the girls softball leagues, and the tennis courts. Today I've talked to um, Barry Dowell, and this is nothing official, I've just talked to him about it, and I understand that WNBH is going to pick up the tab for the lights. So the, as far as I know, effective Monday, it's not confirmed again that the lights will be turned on again with WNBH picking up the tab. They are Barry Munia, congratulations on a very successful recreation. Thank you, Billy. That was Recreation Day 1978, and this has been the Sports Show. See you next week.
Sunday, August 13th, the New Bedford Country Club, four ball championships. Steve McGargle hits from the 14th fairway. This is the Sports Show. I'm Bill Walsh. We'll be right back. College life can be exciting, but it can also be expensive. There is a way. The Navy offers scholarships for qualified students. Naval ROTC does not disrupt the normal activities of college life, and it prepares a student for responsibility as a Navy officer. Contact your Navy recruiter. The Navy. It's not just a job. It's an adventure. Saturday, August 12th. The Country Club of New Bedford, the scene of the annual four-ball tournament, by far the most prestigious golfing event in the area. It was Mark Gaudu and Bob Laflamme taking on Charlie Beckman and Jim Pelor in the first semifinal match of the day, with Beckman and Pelor avenging last year's semifinal defeat with a 2-1 and one victory to advance to the championships. In the other semifinal matchup, it was the youngsters, 19-year-old Joel Gonzalez and 20-year-old Steve McGargle, up against the popular duo of Terry McCormick and Dr. Bob Harding. The exciting match ended on the 17th hole, the youngsters emerging victorious. And the stage was set for the championships the following day, Joel Gonzalez and Steve McGargle versus the team of Charlie Beckman and Jim Pelor for the Country Club Four Ball Championship. We pick up the action on the first fairway. Joel Gonzalez safely in the fairway on the par four, 385 yard first hole. And he strokes a beautiful shot from about 180 yards away four feet past the pin. Partner Steve McGargle in about the same area along the fairway of the first hole. It's a very nice shot. It's going right at the pin. Lands a little to the left. It's about 18 feet away in good shape. Charlie Beckman's second shot landed just at the fringe of the green. He's chipping up now for a three. And almost gets it. The ball just almost rolls all over the hole. Joel Gonzalez putting for a birdie three here. If he puts it in, they win the hole. He's about 10 feet away and sinks it. Gonzalez and McGargle go one up after the first hole. On the second hole, 305 yard par four with a dog leg to the right. Jim Peeler had a beautiful shot over the woods, landing just two feet from the pin. Gonzalez third shot. A chip from the fringe goes right and long, and he'll be out of contention for the hole. Beckman puts in his two footer to win the hole with a birdie. The match all even. All golfers hit safely onto the fairway on the par four, 365 yard third hole. Steve McGargle seen here with his approach shot to the green. And he hits a magnificent shot, just feet to the left away from the pin. Charlie Beckman putting from the fringe, he gives it a firm stroke. And it looks, no, almost went in. Partner Jim Peeler, chipping up from the trap, hits the pin and bounces away about two feet away. Excellent, excellent shot. Joel Gonzalez has about a 25-foot putt here to win. He strokes it firmly. It's close. It looks good, but no. Just goes a little to the right. Partner Steve McGargle puts in his two-footer to win the third hole. McGargle and Gonzalez one up. The 
yard fourth hole, Joel Gonzalez. Where is it? With about a 100 yarder from the green and it lands in the trap. Tough luck. Partner Steve McGargle. About 30 yards further away from his partner Joel Gonzalez. Hits an excellent shot right up onto the green, about 10 feet away from the cup. Both Beckman and Peeler landed in the trap. Beckman getting out nicely here, bringing it to within four feet of the pin. Gonzalves with a tough shot out of the trap. Trying to get it over that lip. Doesn't experience too much success. Just putting it on the fringe of the green. He should be out of contention for scoring on this hole. Jim Peeler also in this almost an identical situation. It's an excellent shot out of the trap, putting it to within five feet of the pin. Steve McGargle has about a 10 footer here. If he can sink this, they'll be in very good shape to win the hole. He lines it up. He's taking his time. Strokes it nice and softly and puts it in the hole. Definitely putting the pressure on Charlie Beckman. Charlie Beckman has to stick in this five-footer with his unorthodox putting style in order to have the hole. And he does. So, going to the fifth, it's McGargle and Gonzalez still one up. McGargle's tee shot off the 490-yard fifth hole almost hits the gallery. Jim Peeler in the fairway. He's about 200 yards away, and he nubs the ball. One of the few lousy shots we've seen so far today. Jim Peeler with about a 40-foot putt from just onto the fringe of the green. Strokes it firmly. And comes close, but goes beyond, leaving it about four feet beyond the hole. Joel Gonzalez. Loosening up. Getting ready for his putt. On the fifth green. Steadies himself. Strokes it nicely and just barely misses. Charlie Beckman must put in this 20-foot putt in order, and he does! Charlie Beckman puts in a 24-foot putt and that will have the hole. Joel Gonzalez hit a beautiful approach shot on the sixth green. It leaving it about eight feet away. Jim Peeler will now try his luck from the fairway. And he hits a very, very nice shot. Almost a perfect golf shot, about eight feet from the cup. Steve McGargle, just off the fringe, however, using his putter. Strokes it nice and softly and just didn't read it quite properly. Joel Gonzalez on the sixth green. He has about an eight footer. If he puts this in, it will be for a birdie putt and they will win the hole. It should read a little left to right, if I'm not mistaken. Gives it a good, nice stroke. Leaves it on the lip. The hole will be have McGargle and Gonzalez still one up. Jim Peeler was the only player able to get on the par three, 175 yard seventh hole, and he putted in to make the match even. The 390 yard eighth hole at the Country Club saw both Gonzalves and McGargle making par to win the hole, again going one up onto the ninth. Joel Gonzalves lining up his tee shot on the 410 yard par four ninth hole here at the Country Club, and whistles a beautiful shot down the fairway, right down the middle, should be a good 260 yards away. His teammate Steve McGargle is also in good position along the fairway, hitting an excellent tee shot as well. 
and Jim Peel a wax one way off into the distance. That's a good 280 yards down the fairway. He'll be in very good shape for his next shot. Charlie Beckman taking a couple practice swings. The other three players in very excellent position for their second shot. And judging from this ball, he will be as well. It's a little down the left and a little shorter than the other players, but all in excellent position. Jim Peeler's fairway shot from the ninth. Looks excellent going right at the pin and lands just to the left and bounces back. He's about eight yards away. Joel Gonzalez landed a little over to the right over a mound. He'll be chipping on. And he seems to leave it a little short. He's about 10 feet away. Steve McGargle is the only hope on this hole as Gonzalez is out of the scoring. He's right off the fringe and will have about an 18-footer. Hits it firmly. It's going right at the hole and just barely misses, going two feet beyond. Beckman has a stroke on this hole by virtue of his handicap. So he wants to get this putt as close to the hole as possible without going beyond. And he almost puts it in, just going a foot and a half beyond. Jim Peeler will be shooting to score on this ball alone. He's going right at the hole, but misses to the left. Steve McGoggle drops in his two-footer. And now it's up to Beckman, using his unorthodox style again. He knocks in a two-footer to get a net birdie, win the hole, and the match even. The 400-yard par-4 tenth hole, Joel Gonzalez teeing off. And he hits a nice shot down the fairway, coming right at us and laying to rest, about 260 yards down the fairway. Steve McGargle, his partner, tees off as well. And it also is coming right at us. And it bounds past his partner's ball, coming to rest maybe 15 yards past Joel Gonzalez. Charlie Beckman got into a little trouble on, under the trees on the left on his tee shot. He's chipping out now. And he punches one right keeps it low and it's rolling. It will be short of the green over onto the right. Jim Peeler's shot landed behind the trees. He's hitting now obstructed from view and he's having to go over the trees in order to get to the green. And he does and he hits it right up on the green it's rolling to the pin and it will fall two feet short. A magnificent shot by Jim Peeler. With Peeler in a position for a birdie, Gonzalves from the fairway is going to have to go right for the pin. And he strokes a very nice shot. It'll be on the green. It hits nicely, bounces and stays. He's about 12 to 15 feet away from the cup. Steve McGargle, who also landed on the green with a very nice shot, will have to attack the hole on this putt. He has to score because it's almost a sure birdie for Jim Peeler. He gives it a firm stroke. It's going right at the hole, and oh, it just trails right at the last second. It's all up to Joel Gonzalez right now. He must sink this putt, for Peeler has almost a sure thing in order to have the hole. It's going right at the cup, and it's, oh, it just misses a little to the left. All Jim Peeler has to do now is sink this putt, and they will win the hole. He should make it, and yes, he does. Jim Peeler and Charlie Beckman take the lead for the first time in the match. Steve McGargle, safely in the fairway, will be hitting up to this 400-yard par-4 11th hole, his team trailing for the first time in this match. A good shot. 
That'll be on the green. Yes, lands right behind the pin, about nine to ten feet away. An excellent golf shot. Charlie Beckman left his approach shot somewhat behind the green in the fringe, and he chips up now. It's rolling right to the pin. An excellent golf shot by Charlie Beckman. McGargle will now putt out approximately nine feet from the cup. It will go a little right to left. Nice soft stroke. Goes to the hole and just barely misses. The hole will be halved. Charlie Beckman safely in the fairway on the 385 par 4 12th hole. Hits a nice approach shot. That will be on the green and it lands, oh, about 30 feet to the left of the pin in fine shape. Jim Peeler, in just about the same area where his partner just hit, hits his approach shot up to the green. That will be a fine shot as well. It's going right at the pin, lands left about nine feet away from the pin to the left. Excellent shape. Steve McGargle, also right straight away on the fairway. His team in the unfamiliar position as they're trailing now. Hits his shot to the green. It looks like it might go over. And it does. The people are moving out of the way. He hits it over the green into the rough. His partner, Joel Gonzalez, must try and salvage this hole. Strokes a nice shot from straight away. It'll be on the green. Oh, beautiful shot. Lands it about four feet away to the right of the pin. Steve McGargle in the rough behind the green is hitting out of a crowd of people. We can barely see him at this point. He will be attacking the hole trying to get it as close to the pin as possible. And there it comes. It shoots out of the crowd and goes to the hole. Beautiful golf shot. He'll be in fine position for his follow-up putt. Charlie Beckman in good shape. He'll be trying to roll this putt uphill about 20 feet. He could win the hole on this putt if he sinks it. And it's close, but no. He rolls past a little to the left. Jim Peeler, about 15 feet away. His putt will be rolling downhill. A fairly straight putt. It's going at, it'll be short, it'll be short. Joel Gonzalez sunk his putt. So all Jim Peeler has to do now is put in this two-footer to have the hole, which he does. And we will move off to the 13th. Beckman and Peeler still one up. Steve McGargle nicely in the fairway. He has a good angle and an approach shot to the 13th green. He hits it well. It will go on the green. A beautiful shot. Lands short and rolls up. He's about five feet away. His partner, Steve Gonzalez. Just a little to the right from where McGoggle hit. Hits up on the green as well. And yes, it's also on the green. A beautiful shot, about 18 feet to the left. Charlie Beckman also put his approach shot on the 13th green as well. So now Steve Gonzalez will putt first. A little uphill, going right to left. He's taking his time. He's studying it. Strokes the ball. It's rolling to the hole. And goes in. Steve Gonzalez puts in a pressure putt on the 13th green. The pressure is really on Charlie Beckman now as he puts to the hole uphill. No, he misses it. The match is tied, going into the 14th. Jim Peeler from under the tree on the right side of the fairway on the 14th hole. Strikes it out of there. It's a low slung shot, it'll go right and it will land in the bunker. Steve McGargle's second shot. He's about 160 yards away on the fairway. The match all even. 
and he stroked a fine shot. It's headed right for the pin. He should be in very good shape. And the ball goes in the hole. What an amazing shot. Chris Hendricks, how about that? I don't think I've ever seen a shot like that in any kind of competition, Bill. An eagle for Steve McGoggle. He wins the hole, and suddenly the team of Gonzalves and McGoggle go one up here on the 14th hole. Pandemonium down on the fairway as everyone is trying to get to Steve McGoggle to congratulate him. He's probably just hit the greatest golf shot of his life. Beckman and Pila have to be stunned. They've been in clear control of this match since the ninth hole, and all of a sudden, Gonzalves and McGoggle, with a birdie on 13 by Gonzalves and this eagle by Steve McGoggle on 14, have put them one up with four to play. The par three, 150 yard 15th hole with the elevated green was halved on shots by Joel Gonzalves and Charlie Beckman. And the team of Gonzalves and McGargle remained one up as we go to the 16th. The only bad shot on the par four, 370 yard 16th hole was made by Steve McGargle, landing way off the fairway, but he recovered beautifully with this great approach shot to the green. As the pressure mounted towards the end of the match, the play only got better. As witnessed these superb golf shots on the 16th green by Charlie Beckman, Joel Gonzalez, and Jim Peeler. They were equally as unshakable on the green as the match built to a fever pitch, the 16th being halved, Gonzalves and McGargle still one up, going to the crucial 17th. Steve McGargle will tee off first at the par 3, 205 yards, 17th, but he has to get over the water hole, which has been the downfall of many a great golfer here at the country club. And it looks long enough, he struck a fine shot, a superb golf shot. It's landed right on the green, about 10 feet to the right of the hole. Partner Joel Gonzalez is next. It does not look long enough, and it's a little to the left. People are moving out of the way, and it goes in the water. Top. Jim Peeler off the 17th tee. The pressure is on. He's on the verge of elimination. But he's hit a fine shot. Almost the exact replica of Steve McGargle's shot. He's about 12 feet away on the right. His partner having gone in the water... Jim Peeler is the only hope now on the 17th. He's got a 12-footer, and it's a very much of a pressure putt because uh, if he can put this in, it should push it over to the 18th. It should, and that also will put the pressure on McGoggle on his putt, which is just about the same distance. And again, as we mentioned before, McGoggle and Gonzalez do not want to go to the 18th when Charlie Beckman has a stroke. He's a little high, and McGoggle will have a run for a win. Steve McGargle now. The pressure eased off a little bit. If he puts in this putt, they will win the hole and win the four ball championship. This putt should break from McGargle's right to his left. It's about a 10 footer. Plus he has the advantage of uh, seeing uh, the putt just before his, which was almost identical. He lines it up. 
Gives it a firm stroke. It looks good. Yes! They've won the New Bedford Country Club Four Ball Championship. Steve McGargle and Joel Gonzalez won excellent match. A super match, Bill. Super final by four great golfers. They all came out firing, birdieing the first four holes. I think there were seven birdies altogether, plus an eagle. That's great golf in any level of competition. Joel Gonzalez, Steve McGargle, 48th annual New Bedford Country Club Four Ball Champions. I'm with Steve McGargle and Joel Gonzalez, the champions of the New Bedford Country Club Four Ball Tournament. Joel, it must be very satisfying for you. Oh, satisfying isn't the word. I've been around here a long time, you know, and to win this thing, it's incredible because it's a once-in-a-lifetime thing. There's only two teams that have ever won it twice, and to do this once is incredible, especially for two guys our age. Joel, what do you think the turning point in the match was? Well, it had to be 13, I guess. We were one down, going down 13, and Steve hit a super shot in, but I just happened to make the birdie ahead of him. He would have made it anyway, I'm sure. But then he made a super eagle on 16, and uh, that turned it around, put us one up, and we just sort of, I mean, 14, sorry. And that sort of coasted in from there. Steve, the uh, 14th hole, you uh, made one of the greatest shots I think I've ever seen. An eagle, how far away were you from the hole? Well, it was about 152 to the middle of the green, and he, Joseph figured it was probably 10 yards back more to the flag. And so I hit a six iron. We were debating between seven and six. And I hit a six iron, and... Uh, it's an awful thing to say, but I actually pulled it a little. I was trying to hit it right at the flag and fade it a little, and when I hit it, I hit it at the left side of the green, it faded back, and went in on that one hop. What did you think when the ball disappeared? Uh, I was really excited, <laughs> really. Steve McGargle, Joel Gonzalez, champions of the New Bedford Country Club Four Ball Tournament. Thank you, Ben. Also, in the First Division Consolation Championship, the popular team of Ken Katowski and attorney Walter Smith defeated Mo Lincourt and Brad Faxton 2-1. Liberty Ports Pacific. The Navy. See your recruiter or call toll-free. It's not just a job, it's an adventure.